So my task today is to talk about silver. The Silver Yearbook has a number of sponsors, uh, mining companies, exploration and development companies, refiners, uh, industry associations, exchanges. We try to have a broad, diverse group of people. Brian told me I have 20 minutes to get done, so I'll go fast. Plus or minus, Plus or minus one or two hours. Uh, and then, as I said, we have launched our first uh, Chinese language silver yearbook last week in China. We had the Shanghai White Platinum and Silver Exchange as the primary partner in this venture. We plan to do this annually now. Uh, we also had five Chinese uh, companies, including China Min Metal, as sponsors of the Chinese uh, language edition. And the Silver Institute was the, an international sponsor of the uh, Chinese language version. The price of silver appears to us to have peaked in April of 2011. And as time goes by that on, that becomes a more and more jaundiced-seeming comment. Uh, it has basically, after it peaked in April 2011, came down and spent much of the time from September 2011 until April of this year trading between roughly $26 and $35. You can see that the price started to deteriorate from $35 in September of 2012, in line with gold and, and a number of other commodities. It came down and was trading just above that $26 support level, which we had seen tested three times prior to that. When we saw the price come down, as with gold, we were not seeing the kind of purchases, bargain hunting, buying by investors, that you had seen in September of 2011, uh, December, January, February 11 and 12, and then again in the summer of last year. Not only were we not seeing it, the market was not seeing it. Investors who had seen $26 as a good bargain level to buy silver over the last 18 months were backing away from that level and were seemingly saying to the market, still interested in silver maybe, but not at this price. Saw this in gold. There has been talk about the disconnect between the paper market and the physical market and our comment has been in both gold and silver, there was no disconnect. Prior to April 12th, with the price above $26, people were not buying a lot of silver in the physical market, and they were not buying a lot of silver in the paper market. You did see a wave of short selling, which actually began in January of this year, and had gotten to be a very large short position on the COMEX by the end of March already. And on April 12th, you saw further selling, which took the price below that level. There is a tremendous amount of technically driven, momentum indicator driven uh, buying and selling in commodities, as in other financial assets. And we saw a wave of this kind of program selling, which then took the price sharply lower uh, to levels above $23. Uh, and the price has been consolidating around that level and uh, is looking somewhat vulnerable on a short-term basis to a further decline. But from a longer-term perspective, it's about where we had expected the price to be. In preparing for my speech and going over my slides last night, I was worried that I was doubling up on Rohit's and Erica's presentations uh, and that they would have talked a lot about our economic outlook. Uh, but I sabotaged Rohit's presentation, so I get to talk about it. <laughs> Very briefly, our expectation has been what we call a muddle through economic outlook. Subpar economic growth with very low interest rates, uh, relatively controlled inflation, high unemployment. As Europe, the United States, Japan deleverage, and as the world suffers through an economic situation with a lot of long-term structural problems that have not been resolved, uh, but have been somewhat papered over, 
with some improvement in the control system and not a lot of confidence in political leaders that they have the political will to make the relatively easy adjustments that are needed to be made to right the economic ship of state. And in that environment, our expectation is that this period of subpar growth, low interest rates, high unemployment will continue for several years, and that that's the economic environment in which commodities uh, will be operating. That's actually kind of interesting to us as analysts because what that suggests is neither sharply lower prices nor a continuation of the boom market years that we saw from 2002 up until 2011. It's a much more broken field uh, with strong positive fundamentals and strong positive economic conditions, not so much necessarily strong enough to drive prices sharply higher, but also strong enough to keep prices from falling. In terms of the fundamentals, the key factors that we've seen, which we are putting forth in our silver book this year, is that we did see investment demand increase last year, uh, and we have it declining this year. It increased last year, I'll show you a chart in a second, because it was down in 2011 because of higher prices. And as the price backed off after 2011, investors took that opportunity to buy, as I said, every time the price got down around $26, $27, $28. Net refined supply rose slightly last year, continuing a trend that has continued for a while. And we expect it to be basically flat this year. And fabrication demand fell 1.8%, relatively small amount, as we saw weakness in a number of applications. We expect a little bit of a recovery, a little bit more than 2% growth in fabrication demand this year. Looking at investment demand, I'm sorry if the price line kind of blocks out the bar for 2011. Uh, but you can see that the silver market is one, we sometimes say it's like a tanker, ocean tanker. It turns very slowly. It's a, the silver market is a market where investors will decide that they want to buy silver, and they'll buy it for 10 years. And then they'll decide that they want to sell silver, and they'll sell it for 15 years. And they will sell enormous amounts of silver. In 2005, investors became net buyers of silver again, having sold not only the metal that they had accumulated in the 1980s, but metals that they had accumulated in the 1960s and metals that they had accumulated prior to that. And they became net buyers. The fundamentals had shifted, the economic environment had shifted. Investors as a group decided to start buying silver. In essence, bidding the price higher. You can see that the price of silver had been bumping along around $5, $455, really from the late 1980s until about 2004, 2005. And as investors pulled back from being net sellers, 2002, 3, 4, 5, and turned into net buyers after that, the price of silver started rising higher. Investors were basically bidding silver away from fabricators, bidding the price higher, and rebuilding inventories. Uh, silver investors accumulated about 135, 140 million ounces a year in 2011 and 2010. As the price rose in 2011, uh, I'm sorry, in 2009 and 10, they were buying that much. As the price rose in 2011, they did pull back and you did see a significant amount of selling in April and May, primarily in May of 2011. Uh, some of that was then bought back after the price fell back down. But when the price got to 37, $47, $49 an ounce, and then fell back to $33 in a matter of a few days, you had a lot of investors coming out of the market. And so you had a decline uh, below 100 million ounces in terms of net accumulation of silver. That was still the sixth or seventh largest annual net uh, accumulation of silver uh, on record. And then we saw an increase again last year as the price fell.
disaggregating investment demand, you can see that the, and you can see better than I can, the blue portion of the bar on the left is India. And India has been a consistent net buyer of silver for a couple hundred years in reality, but you know, this only goes back a decade. We have seen India as a consistent net buyer of investment products as well as silver jewelry, statues, and decorative items that have a quasi-investment uh, purpose. China, the yellow portion of that bar, has begun to emerge over the last few years. There has always been an interest in silver in China. When the communists took over in 1949, the primary currencies used to transact business in China were US, Spanish, and Cuban silver coins. And there was a tremendous amount of these silver coins circulating in China throughout that period. Uh, when I started at J. Aaron in 1980, I learned that we were consistent net buyers of semi-refined silver from the Chinese government, and this was old coin scrap that was being bought out of the countryside year in, year out, 30 years after the revolution. And then the gray portion is the rest of the world. And you can see prior to 2005, the rest of the world were very large net sellers, and since that time, they've become very large net buyers. The right-hand chart looks at the investment vehicles that investors are using. The green portion are coins. The brown portion are exchange-traded products. Uh, a lot of people are used to exchange-traded funds, but if you look at some of the myriad silver products out there, they're actually not exchange-traded funds, they're exchange-traded products at this point, so we've switched to ETP. And then the gray portion is other, by which we mean uh, bullion bars, medallions, fake coins, which are very popular in various parts of the world. They look like maple leaves, but they weren't struck by the Canadian mint. They look like Maria Theresa dollars, but they weren't struck by the Austrian mint. Uh, and you can see there a lot of that stuff, which is the traditional way of buying silver, has been being sold over the last several years and continues to be sold. There's been a migration away from that kind of silver investment to silver coins and to ETPs. ETPs really began around 27. They were bumping along. When we had a financial crisis in 2008, 2009, there was a period of time where it was tough to find coins or 100 ounce silver bars or 10 ounce silver bars, smaller products. And so you actually saw a surge of investors using the exchange traded products in order to buy that exposure. That continued 2009 and 2010. In 2011, we actually saw net liquidation of exchange traded products for the first time since they had really uh, been launched in 2006. It was relatively small. By the end of 2012, uh, they had rebuilt their position and moved to new highs. And year to date this year, they've been continuing to add to their positions. In terms of coins, the US Mint publishes monthly data and month year to date data on its Silver Eagle sales. Other mints that produce silver coins do not publish monthly data. So you have to rely on the US Eagle data as a surrogate for measurements of the coins. But you can see that we had been bumping along for a number of years at relatively solid uh, purchases. And then really, again, around 2005, 2006, we've seen a big increase in coins. I just want to point out that the 2013 is a year-to-date number. If you annualize that, you see very strong purchases uh, for 2013, if we maintain the rate of sales that we've seen in the first uh, three and a half months, four months of the year. And then this is the breakdown. And again, the US uh, Mint accounts for about 36% of the market. Canada uh, and China are also large producers of silver coins, and then there are some smaller ones. And this is the, 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 the red is the gross long of non-commercial investors' funds on the COMEX silver futures and options. 
the blue is the gross shorts and the black is the net line. You can see that prior to say 2000, 2002, you had investors who were willing to take very large short positions at times. Note that those short positions tend to be very short-lived, which is important to understanding the nature of short selling in the market. After 2002, 2003, you saw a sharp diminution in the willingness of investors to go short silver. And you saw, generally speaking, an increase in their willingness to go long. And that continued up until late 2012, early 2013. And we've seen, as I said earlier, starting in January of this year, an increased willingness to go short silver on the part of participants on the COMEX. And we'll be honest, you know, futures and options are the best way to short commodities. And the COMEX represents the bulk of futures and options. So if you're going to go short, you're probably not going to go short in the physical market or the forward market. You'll probably do it here. So you saw, even prior to April 11th and 12th, a buildup of the largest short position in silver, the largest position since 2005, just before that silver price really took off and investors became net buyers. Basically, what you're seeing is that investors who have been extremely bullish since 2005 still are, on a net basis, bullish, but they're a lot more cautious and there are a lot more of them willing to be short the market than long. Turning to supply, mine production has been rising pretty consistently since the early 1990s. About 80% of it comes from byproduct at copper, lead, zinc, and gold mines. So part of this represents the bullish demand for copper, lead, zinc, and gold that we've seen and the expansion in mining in the base metals. But we've also seen a sharp increase in primary silver production. Companies like Great Panther saying silver makes sense. It's not sustainable at $5. Let us go out, find good deposits, build them, and mine silver for silver's sake. And you've seen primary silver mines increase their stake of total mine production from, I don't know, less than 70% a decade ago to uh, I mean, I'm sorry, less than 20% uh, to about 25 or 30% now. You've also seen an increase in secondary supply, which is a function of two or three factors. The first one is higher silver prices stimulate increased sale of silver bearing scrap. The second one is that as time goes by, you have a larger body of silver jewelry, decorative objects, and other things with silver in them so that there's a natural increase as these products are sold by people for their silver content and refined. A third trend has been an increased uh, interest in collecting silver and other metals from end-of-life electronic and other industrial uh, fabricated products, so, uh, some of which interest has been mandated by government regulation saying you've got to turn this stuff in uh, for recycling when, and not just put it in your garbage. And actually, there's a fourth factor, which is economic stringencies. In tough times, people will sell their silver statues or their silverware or their silver jewelry in order to raise cash. And those four factors have combined to boost silver secondary recovery. All of them, I should point out, are somewhat price elastic and can come off. Silver cash costs, the average cost was about $10 last year. And you can see from this that 90% you know, of the production came in at prices below $20. Uh, and then you have one bad tail out there. <coughs> and this is just at primary producers. So this excludes the 70, 75% of production from byproduct producers. And mine production is growing in a number of countries. China is now the second largest producer of silver, having uh, supplanted Peru for that position in recent years. Mexico is still the largest producer. China is gaining on it. Peru is still a very large producer. 
The United States and Canada have had some problems. Australia comes and goes. Almost all of the production in Australia is byproduct, and there have been technical issues and such at various base metals companies there that have caused the fluctuations year to year in Aust Australian output. And then this is secondary supply, which again, as I was saying, was about a thousand, uh, 100 million ounces a year 20 years ago, uh, and it rose consistently to 250, 260, 270 million ounces. Uh, a lot of it is still jewelry. Actually, back in the 80s and 90s, even into this century, a uh, significant portion of the old scrap was from photographic waste. That has gone away as photography and imaging have moved to digital, although you still have a significant amount of silver that is used and recovered from photographic products, uh, especially x-rays, but also commercial photography, and photography used in advertising and magazine public uh, production. Uh, you are seeing increased recovery from jewelry and silverware and increased recovery from uh, electronics. Fabrication demand has been a very mixed bag. As I said, it fell about 1.8% last year. We expect it to rise a little bit more than 2% this year. At the bottom, you can see that photography, which used to be the largest use of silver, peaked around 1999-2000 and has been steadily declining. It is still, silver is still used in photographic papers and films. Uh, and it will continue to be used, but you're seeing a, de a steady decline. There's actually a deceleration of the rate of decline with the bulk of the decline probably already behind the market. And a lot of the people who still use silver-based film and paper likely to continue to use silver-based film and paper. Jewelry and silverware actually has taken up a lot of the slack. Uh, and it has held up better than, say, gold or platinum jewelry, partly because of the price differential. With the high prices for precious metals in general, one of the things that you've seen is that there has been a shift towards silver jewelry at the expense of gold and platinum jewelry. So silver jewelry demand has suffered, but it has come off uh, less, perhaps, than some of the other industries. Electronics is doing very well, and at the very top there, you'll see uh, solar uh, photovoltaics, which I'll come back to later. Jewelry, I mentioned with scrap, I mean, jewelry demand is flavored by a number of things, one of which is disposable incomes. When people have more disposable income, when they're doing better, and when they have higher discretionary earnings, money left over after food and housing and energy and school tuitions and medical uh, costs, they will buy more silver jewelry along with other jewelry. It's just the nature of the beast. And that has helped keep jewelry demand higher. On the other applications, there is a high correlation between silver use and industrial output. And it's not surprising, silver is used in a wide array of manufactured goods and services. It's used in electronics, it's used in automobiles, it's used in uh, housing, um, mirrors, ball bearings, solders. It's, an, uh, it's a very versatile metal that's used in a lot of applications. Electronics demand has been growing and growing very strongly. We measure silver at the point where the silver is used. And you can see China is added in there around 1999, 2000, and has become a very big source of silver demand for use in uh, electronics. Part of that is the growth in China as a manufacturing site. A significant portion of the electronic components that are made using silver in China are used for the Chinese market, but a significant portion are also exported to other countries. We've seen since 2000 is an increased direct use of silver in China at the expense of other countries. Even so, you've seen growth in the United States in silver use, 
and it's actually shifting a little bit back uh, as our competitiveness improves. And you've seen growth in uh, Japan, relatively flat, Europe uh, somewhat better, and other countries that are competing with China for this application. That said, the growth rate is slowing. Uh, there are efficiencies of use. Technological changes are constant in the electronics industry. Tablet computers use a tenth of as much pla uh, precious metals as, the, as old notebooks and, and desktop computers. So you're seeing a constant technological shift, which cuts both ways. As they use silver in new products, demand booms, as those products either become smaller or more efficiently in their use of silver or are obsolete and replaced by other things, you can see this kind of plateauing. And we expect that to continue. Photovoltaics was the big new growth in silver use. You can see that prior to 2005, it was just you know 5 million ounces or so less. S following after that, you saw a very rapid growth, both in the production of solar panels, the installation of solar panels, and the use of silver. And during that period from 2005 into 2010 uh, and 11, one of the trends that was going on was that if you increased the silver loadings, you increased the electrical output of solar panels and made them more efficient. So with uh, during that period of time, you saw tremendous growth in the number of solar panels, but you also saw people using more and more silver per panel. In 2012, we saw the first decline uh, since records were begun a, a decade ago, 12, 12 years ago, in silver use. You can see that the differential between solar panel production and installations started to get out of line in 2009, continued in ele uh, 10 and 11. Basically, solar manufacturers were producing more panels than they were installing. And you had a buildup of uninstalled panels, which led the, gave the panel manufacturers the opportunity to pull back from manufacturing as much. In addition to that, you had a reduction in subsidies for solar panel installation in Germany, Italy, and a number of other countries during the economic, uh, the Great Recession and the follow through. So you had this buildup of inventories, which plagued the market and was one of the reasons why you saw this pullback in 2012 in terms of the silver use. We think that that adjustment's behind the market and we're looking for uh, continued growth or resumed growth in solar panel uh, consumption this year. Photography continues to decline. It is a 100-year-old technology that is being replaced heavily uh, by digital imaging. That said, you can see, for example, motion pictures, the little blue stuff at the bottom, has been relatively stable. There is a shift to digital fil uh, movies in theaters, but there is a tremendous amount of pressure in the film industry to retain using film. Um, Basic photography has seen the biggest decline. People are moving to digital imaging. Uh, and x-rays have been relatively stable. And other uses, again, it's a mixed bag. And silver is used all over the place. This is the national thing, but you could look at like silver use in ethylene oxide catalysts, which are you, ethylene oxides used to make polyethylene and a number of other products, has been very strong. Uh, solder has been very strong. Other applications have suffered. I have a few more slides about just the markets in general, and then we'll open it up for questions. This chart compares reported inventories to prices. And you're almost tempted to say, well, there's a pretty good correlation. But it's interesting because if you look at it, in 1979-1980, you actually had declining reported inventories, and a very sharp increase in silver prices. That's because investors were buying silver that was existing in COMEX registered inventories and taking delivery of it and putting it in their homes or bank deposit boxes or elsewhere. Similarly, in the 90s, you had an ex a period of time, well, in the late 80s into the 90s, you had a period of time of rapid and enormous increases in reported inventories, and the price of silver was falling. 
that represented a period of time when those investors who had bought earlier, if you remember that net investment supply demand chart earlier, that represented a period of time when those investors were selling their silver, fabrication demand was less than total supply, and you actually had a situation where that silver was being sold to market makers who would then register it with the COMEX and hedge their position against the COMEX. So you had silver coming out of unreported inventories held by investors going into dealer inventories which were re showing up in reported inventories. So you had this increase in inv inventories and one could have an impulse to say, well, inventories are rising. Uh, I guess investors are buying, but in fact, investors were selling, which was reflected in the lower price. Similarly, across the 90s, you saw those reported inventories decline uh, as investors started using some of it. And then since 2005, you've seen a sharp increase in both reported inventories and in the price. The increase in reported inventories since 2006 or so reflects the advent of exchange-traded products where you had silver that was held, as I said earlier, in 1,000-ounce bars, 100-ounce bars, coins, medallions, fake coins. People were selling that material and buying ETFs for a variety of reasons. And so you had this migration of silver from unreported inventories to reported inventories. You also had a lot of new people coming in buying ETFs and coins who hadn't been holding silver before. So you did have an increase in investment demand and it was compounded by the shift from unreported uh, investor inventories into, into inventories. Comex, as I said earlier, is the major place where futures are traded. You have futures traded on a number of other exchanges around the world, but Comex part of the CME group is still the bulk of the volume. We have seen a tremendous growth in silver uh, futures and options trading since the middle of the last decade, and then it came down sharply last year as investors pulled back from this market. And finally, just looking at some of the reported market data, the pink or salmon bars are futures and options trading volumes. You can see the sharp rise into 2011, and the decline, albeit still very high uh, levels in 2012. And the yellow part is the clearing volume through the London interbank market, which was extremely high in the late 1990s when they started reporting data, came down very sharply in the depth of the silver bear market at the turn of the century, and has risen back, although not as strongly, uh, not back to the late 1990s levels in recent uh, weeks. That concludes the presentation, and I will open it up to questions. Yes? You've mentioned this in the past, but you didn't um, break it out in any of these charts, but isn't there a, an increase in the use in the medical field, and how would that, is that folded into the other use, or how would it compare? in terms of a percentage of growth against some of these other? Well, there, there, there are two uses. There's medical, which is increasing. It's a, a relatively small amount. There's three uses, medical, dental, and biocides. And biocides have been increasing very sharply in a percentage term, but it's just a few million ounces. So it, you know, it's not a market maker, if you will. In addition to which, you've had some environmental investigations and regulatory actions which have caused a pause, at least for now, in the use of silver and biocides, which are a quasi-medical application, uh, while people sort through the environmental implications of it. Uh, Yuri, I have a comment and a question for you. Uh, you know, uh, silver, uh, I'm sure, I'm talking about the Asian space, that the British sold opium to the Chinese in the late 1800s, and they brought silver to India, and they were uh, doing this for a long time. So uh, somebody told me that there's huge deposits of silver which no one has track of in India. And I would like you to comment on that. The second thing is, uh, in 1979, the Hunt brothers tried to corner the silver market. 
and uh, silver spiked to just under $50 with it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the free, the lot of smuggling took takes place of gold and silver in India at that time. And one of the sons of one of the smugglers, who I met recently in Dubai, was telling me that, can you ask somebody who's knowledgeable if this cornering of the silver market could take place again? Is that something which could happen again, in your opinion? Okay, first on silver inventories. We actually have estimates. Uh, yeah, it's, there's a tremendous amount of silver. I think, where's Rohit? I'm thinking three billion ounces of silver. More than that. There are billions of ounces of silver that appear to be in India. There are hundreds of millions of ounces that appear to be in China. Most of that silver came from Latin America. And it's a fascinating history of the silver that was plundered in Latin America brought to Europe, where they basically had a continental Europe, basically had gold standards, but England had a bimetallic standard. So you could take your excess silver, which was glutting the market in Europe, and ship it over to England and exchange it for gold, which caused a ru run on the gold market in, 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 in England, and England did several things. They, uh, they invented the silverware industry to find a use for all this stuff, and they found that they could ship it to India and China for goods, because India and China in the 18th century represented half of the world economy. And as the Europeans would go there to trade, they'd say, well, we got this wool and there's this stuff called gin, and that's about it. You know, oh, we, we stole some brass on the way around Africa from, from African people, and we have some brass and bronze and, and copper that we'll sell you. And they found that your, uh, the Indians and Chinese didn't really want a lot of European goods, but they wanted a lot of Indian and Chinese goods. And they found that they would take silver and to a lesser extent gold. So that's where that silver comes from. And it's billions of ounces. We have some estimates, and I think actually we went through it just recently uh, for a client going through it. The smuggling came after independence from India, and what you had was a tremendous demand for both gold and silver still within India, mostly gold. So you had smuggling of gold into India, and the smugglers would pay for the gold by smuggling silver out of India. It was hell on the Indian uh, foreign exchange market, and this was at a time of fixed exchange rates. So the Indian government banned both export, imports and exports of gold and silver for many years, from the, late 19, uh, from the 1960s into around the late 1990s. And then they got rid of that. They realized they weren't controlling the smuggling at all, so they should make it legal and tax it. Yeah, Washington State took a cue from them. Uh, so that was the smuggling. In terms of the hunts, it's a misconception to believe that the hunts we're trying to corner the market. That's what everybody says, because it's a nice, easy, simple way to say it and understand it. The Hunts looked at the silver market in the 1970s as Warren Buffett looked at it in the 1990s. And he said, you know, when Buffett did it, the price of silver was four and a half dollars. When they did it, the price was one and a half dollars. They looked at the silver supply demand balance they looked at the price of silver and they said, this is a market, the price of which has to rise and rise sharply. So they bought about 65 million ounces of physical silver. They bought futures in addition to that. And then they let the world know that they buy it, bought it. So they saw a wave coming in the silver market which would drive the price higher. And they wanted to ride that wave. And insofar as they could help that wave grow in magnitude, they gladly did by letting people know what smart guys they were. The Hunts were not trying to corner the market, they were trying to ride the wave. They made a couple tactical errors which cost them everything, or not everything, but almost everything later, but that's beside the point. It's not clear that the silver market could have that kind of thing happen again. But the bottom line is that the silver market's a very small illiquid market compared to a lot of other markets. Now the reason I mentioned Berkshire Hathaway, or Warren Buffett, was because that's a telling story post-hunt. Warren Buffett became interested in silver circa 1995. He was, had about 33 billion under management at the time. He said, maybe we should put 2% of our portfolio in silver. They bought a lot of research, good research I should say. They bought a lot of research, studied the market in great detail, and went back to Warren and said, good news, bad news. 
good news is, yeah, the silver market looks like it's a wave that's going to come, and the price, which has been bouncing between three and a half and five dollars for for many years, at some point it's probably going to double, and you could see eight or ten dollars silver, maybe even higher. Bad news is, you're an equity investor, you have 33 billion under management. For something to be significant, you need to put two percent of your portfolio in it. 750 million dollars in 1996, rough. Roughly is equivalent to the market capitalization of the silver mining industry worldwide. So we just can't buy silver equities and get to that two percent threshold. At which point Warren said, "So you're telling me that even little old me, and he only had 33 billion under management at the time, can't get two percent of my portfolio into silver equities?" And they said, "Yes." He said, "So we need to buy silver directly. We need to buy it." Allocate it, take delivery of it, and move it outside of the banking system to a vault where people can't see it. And we'll hold it. We'll pay the storage fees, and we'll wait, and we'll see if this wave comes and doubles the price. He ultimately sold between eight and ten dollars an ounce, and made his objective. And then the price went to thirteen, and he said, "Well, maybe that was a mistake, but I made my objective." So. That tells me that perhaps the silver market's larger and more liquid, even though it's still illiquid by global standards today. It's a lot more liquid than it was in 1979, 1980. So I'm not sure that someone can do to the silver market what the Hunts did in, back then. Yes, you on your slide about shorts was non-commercial shorts. Yes. You want to talk about commercial shorts? Sure. Commercials. Generally speaking, run hedged books. I don't know any bank in the world that will let its traders go home with an unbalanced book. So when you see banks and brokers showing up as having a large short position or long position on a commodity on the COMEX, that probably is a hedge of their physical market activity. There are some brokers, non-banks, that. Have at times taken large exposure. Bear Stearns is no longer in the business. Banks that are still in the business run hedge books, so we do follow the commercial hedge、uh, positions because we want to see what it is. But it is a reflection of two things: it's a reflection of it's a hedge of their business elsewhere, and it's the fact that when you have all of these non-commercials. Either long or short, and they're mostly long. Somebody has to take the other position, and that somebody is a provider of liquidity to the market, and the CFTC defines those as commercials. Other questions? Henry,、uh, two questions: Your price forecast top and bottom, and secondly,、uh, do you agree that、um, risk management on the part of silver companies has not been?、Uh, Optimal in the sense that they should be doing hedging the same way. I think both agree that they should be doing gold hedging. If they're gold companies, Henry, when you're asking a price forecast, you have to give them the date, the time frame. Okay, before the end of the year. Oh, I was going to tell you that before the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you're making it harder for me. <clears throat> <laughs> We think the price of silver has the capacity to spike down as low as twenty dollars between now and the end of the year, and we think that the price has the capacity to rise back to twenty-six, twenty-eight dollars. Let's say twenty-eight dollars. So I'll give you a range of twenty to twenty-eight dollars. In terms of hedging, I'll just say I have always been a proponent of hedging, and always a proponent of smart hedging.、Uh, From my days in Jay Aaron, I have been involved in providing hedging services.、Uh, Jay Aaron was bought by Goldman. We spun off in 1986. There are a variety of reasons that we spun off. I won't go into the details, but we then continued to provide hedging advisory services to producers and consumers. We have a strategy that is really good. I think today you can lock in a floor of $20 at today's price. You can lock in a floor of $20 for the rest of the year.、Uh Two questions. First, there's constantly, and I, this may be a little bit longer, or there may be some truth. That、uh, there's problems in physical delivery.、Uh, 
Um, and so I wanted to hear the comment. The other thing is, is you went through a nice history and you showed how, you know, some of it was $5 for all these years. Do we have the data, or do you have the data, as to what the, the all-in costs were and how long did the industry run for the proof that it had a negative rate or how? I mean, and given today's um, cost, you know, what is a realistic lower level before everybody basically has to shut down? Yeah, okay. Uh, in terms of physical delivery problems, there is a tremendous amount of rumor mongering and, and scare tactics by people trying to sell silver products to investors. But what you're really seeing is tightness in the supply of small milled investment products. If you want a 1,000 ounce good delivery bar, you can have as much as you want today. Just give me an order, you know, 2 million, 5 million ounces, we can procure it for you within two, three days. There's plenty of silver in the de good delivery form. Where you're finding the tightness is 100 ounce bars, 10 ounce bars, one ounce bars, maple leaves, and eagles, and other small milled products that are designed for small investors. And that's because the industry that supplies that has limited capacity to take 1,000 ounce bars, melt them down, cast them, strike them, polish them, and get them to the market. So that's the physical delivery. There's, and you know, it, it's a, it's, the tightness is in small product, it's not in silver. I mentioned earlier, in 2000, late 2008, early 2009, you had a lot of people buying silver and you had tightness in those small products. And what you saw were a lot of people shifted to the silver ETPs, exchange traded products at that time, because there they could buy the exposure uh, to silver that they could not find in the small bar form. In terms of costs back in the day, yes, we do have a data series that shows uh, production costs back then. I mentioned earlier, back then, 80% of production was byproduct of copper, lead, zinc, or gold. And you have a lot of production that can come into the market. Byproduct producers, depending on how they want to play with their accounts, can attribute this at 25 cents an ounce, or $1.25, or 250, or even higher. So you have a lot of production that is extremely low cost that came, continued even when the price was $5. Uh, and the primary producers can continue to produce at a loss as long as their financiers and banks and equity investors allow them to. And you did see a lot of mining companies that suffered mightily not only in you know, the period, say, 2000, 2001, 2002, but also in earlier periods because the production prices, was because the market prices were too low or even uh, below their production costs. Other questions? Yes, Ken. I take that, thank you. Okay. Well, let's not take that as a sign that the dialogue ends. I mean, you can, other people can ask questions. We're still here. We've got the room until five, I believe. Uh, but uh, even beyond today, uh, feel free to reach out to CPM Group uh, with all, for all of your research uh, and consulting and hedging questions uh, related to precious metals and other commodities. Are there any other questions? Lewis, you're running out. <laughs> If there are no other questions, thank you for coming and listening to us today.